I'm Bert Lancaster. I'm standing in Red Square, the heart of Russia, the center of Moscow, the capital of the Soviet Union. Here is St. Basil's Cathedral, the Spassky Bell Tower, the Kremlin Wall, and here behind me, where you see those lines of people, the tomb of Lenin, founder of the Soviet Communist Party and of the Soviet state which in 1977 celebrated its 60th anniversary. On a pleasant summer morning in 1941, nothing seemed more peaceful than Red Square and Moscow itself. It was June 22nd, a Sunday. People were strolling along the broad streets, shopping in the big department stores, going to the country for the day. They did not know that Hitler's legions, five million strong, had crashed over a frontier 1,800 miles long at 4 a.m. that very morning. Nor did they know, not yet, not until a government broadcast at noon, that the Soviet Union was at war. The unknown war. A war that broke Hitler's back and ended his dream of the new order. A war of Stalingrad, or the Battle of Moscow, the siege of Leningrad, the fall of Berlin. A war of the largest land battles ever fought, of the world's greatest tank battle. A war of heroism and sacrifice such as the world has never seen. It was a war that cost Russia 20 million lives, possibly more. To us in the West, even today, this conflict of the Eastern Front remains the unknown war. Our series begins with the first day of that war, June 22nd, 1941. longest day of the year. The last moments of peace. Sprawling from Europe into farthest Asia, Russia was a giant asleep. As Winston Churchill put it, to the rest of the world she was a riddle wrapped in a mystery. Like the United States, she was at peace. Through the mist before the dawn, the German army moved into assault positions. was 4 a.m. The front was 1,800 miles long. The German planning had been meticulous. planes, 6,000 guns, the greatest mass of artillery the world had ever seen.
Russian airfields, railroad crossings, road junctions, and everything that moved on them was hit hard. The Soviet forces were stunned. Hitler had said to his generals, you have only to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down. Hitler had not thought it necessary to declare war on the Soviet Union until after the attack had begun. It was to be a familiar pattern, the blitzkrieg, and its ferocity was appalling. At the end of the first day, many Soviet border troops had been decimated, and 1,200 planes had been destroyed. The border garrisons bore the brunt. In the first minutes of the Nazi attack, the fortress of Brest on the border was enveloped. The Germans had brought up siege guns to reduce it. Fortress sent out a message. This is Fortress Brest we are fighting. what safety they could. From Moscow, the message came that the Russian people had been invaded by Germany. Our cause is just its end. Victory will be ours. That night, Winston Churchill announced that Britain would come to the aid of the Soviet Union. Russian danger is our danger, he said and the danger of the United States. America was still neutral, but partisan, and President Roosevelt promised aid to the Soviets. Russia had not faced such a mortal threat since the time of Napoleon, or since the Mongol hordes of Genghis Khan poured in 500 years before. Under the assault, many wondered how it all happened. The Soviet intelligence system had revealed exactly what the Germans would do, and American and British intelligence had confirmed it. But Stalin, convinced that the West wanted to push Germany into war with the Soviet Union, remained silent. He avoided anything that might be seized on as a provocation. It was a very complex question for everybody. Against all the evidence, the Soviets had hoped for just one more year of peace. The Unknown War will continue in a moment to June 22, 1941. In the years before the war, in less than a generation, Russia had created an independent economy. The Soviets had collectivized their agriculture and then initiated a crash program of industrialization.
learned as they labored. Hungry for new skills. Or mastery of technology. Factories had to have priority over creature comforts. Hydroelectric power. Energy for new plants for cars. Trucks. Tractors. Through the 1930s, the quality of life in the Soviet Union was improving. There were more goods in the stores. There was no luxury, but the people were well clothed. They seemed content. In Spain, the Civil War broke out. First fight against fascism. Hitler and Mussolini backed Franco. The Soviet Union supported the Republicans and many Soviet citizens volunteered to go. Also on the Republican side were American volunteers of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Ernest Hemingway was there. So was Paul Robeson. Soviet pilots fought Hitler's aces in the air over Madrid. The Germans of the Condor Legion had already brought modern warfare to the civilians of Barcelona and Madrid. had obliterated the town of Guernica, creating a symbol of the horror of war. Picasso memorialized it with a masterpiece. Hitler proclaimed that his Third Reich would last for a thousand years. In Nuremberg, Munich, Berlin, he declared Germany's right to Lebensraum. And the living space he lusted after lay to the east. Ideas that counted his own, Hitler set out to obliterate. works of Tolstoy and Whitman, of Hemingway and Darwin, of Voltaire and Heine fed the bonfires. All culture but Hitler's was to be expunged. Today we own Germany, tomorrow the world. In uns selbst allein liegt die Zukunft des deutschen Volkes. In 1933, the United States and the Soviet Union signed a treaty establishing diplomatic relations. They hoped for peace. Hitler was on a course towards war. Speaking today of our lands and territories in Europe, he said, we look first and foremost towards Russia. Hitler had the full backing of Germany's military industrial complex. was good for Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party was good for Alfred Krupp, the armaments tycoon. Confidently, Hitler reoccupied the Rhineland, took back the Saar Basin and absorbed Austria. He seemed unstoppable. Munich, 
bowing to Hitler's promise of peace, Chamberlain and Deladier, the premiers of England and France, forced Czechoslovakia to relinquish the Sudetenland. Chamberlain said, in spite of the harshness and restlessness I thought I saw in Hitler's face, I got the impression that he was a man who could be relied upon when he gave his word. For Hitler, Munich was another victory. Others called it appeasement. In London, Chamberlain said it meant peace in our time. When the Nazis entered Czechoslovakia, Poland became the last country separating Nazi troops from the Soviet border. England had already signed a pact with Poland, and France was interested in one. On August 12, 1939, the Soviets proposed a defensive pact with Britain, France, Poland, and other Eastern European states. As part of it, Russia sought permission to move troops through Poland if necessary. By August 15th, the Nazis seemed set to attack Poland. The British and French had sent junior officials to Moscow. They requested a postponement of talks until August 21st. Poland steadfastly refused to allow Soviet troops to pass through. Stalin became convinced that the Western powers hoped to turn the Nazis to the East. On August 21st, the Minister of Defense, Borisilov, asked Britain and France their intentions about a mutual alliance in view of Poland's attitude. There was no reply. The Soviets believed they had no choices left. Two days later, Hitler's foreign minister, Joachim von Ribbentrop, arrived in Moscow. On August 23, 1939, the Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression pact was signed. It was an event that stunned the world. For the Russians, it was a way to buy time. The Unknown War will continue in a moment to June 22, 1941. On September 1, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. On September 17, the Red Army crossed the Polish border, reclaiming territory seized by Poland 18 years before. The pact had only delayed the inevitable. For Hitler and his henchmen, the inevitable was only a matter of planning. The Soviet Union was to be invaded. They called it Barbarossa after a German emperor of unusual ferocity. There would be a three-pronged drive into the heart of the Soviet Union. The target to the north was Leningrad. In the center, it was Moscow. And in the south, Kiev in the whole of the Ukraine. The Soviet Union was to be totally destroyed and the land occupied up to a line drawn from Archangel to Astrakhan. May 1st, 1941. Traditional Soviet holiday. The day of the big parade. The show of strength and solidarity. This year, there was also some concern, some uneasiness. Atop Lenin's tomb in Red Square, Marshal Timoshenko warned the people of an extremely complicated international situation. Tremendous efforts were being made to rearm the Red Army with modern weapons, including new tanks. But these efforts had just begun, and the capabilities of their armaments remained in doubt. In 1940, the Soviet Union and Finland 
came into military conflict over border disputes. The Germans watched the difficulties the Soviet army experienced with great interest. Was it a reliable indicator of Soviet strength? Could the Soviet army withstand a Nazi blitzkrieg? The foreign observers at the May Day Parade saw the latest Soviet weapons and pondered the Russians' chances. Stalin watched and continued to hope for at least one more year of preparation. On June 21st, 1941, Molotov asked the German ambassador in Moscow to explain the rumors of war. Unaware of Hitler's plans, the ambassador reassured Molotov that the German intention was peace. June 27, 1941, one day later. The attack had begun at 4 a.m. On a front stretching from the Arctic Circle to the Black Sea, over 1,800 miles, Hitler loosed his legions. In the Kremlin, the German ambassador Schulenberg read to Molotov Hitler's declaration of war. Molotov was stunned. The strike had the weight of 190 divisions, 5 million men, 47,000 guns and mortars, 4,300 tanks, almost 5,000 warplanes. murderous might of a highly advanced industrial nation, the Blitzkrieg and the lightning strike. Hitler's principal ideologist, Alfred Rosenberg, had already worked out his plan for the East. After the victory, all of European Russia would be settled by Germans and become part of the Third Reich. People already there, the Russians, millions of them, would be killed or removed. And the first to be killed would be the Communist Party members. German High Command ordered its advancing troops to punish opposition by executing 50 to 100 Russians for every German killed by a partisan. Hitler often watched the latest newsreels from the front. They delighted him. His surprise attack had worked beyond all expectation. The Soviet cities fell. Grodno, Minsk, Bobrysk, Gomel, Mogilev, Kaunas, Vilnius, Ostrov, Pskov. The annihilation in Poland, Belgium, Holland and France was being repeated, only on a grander scale. Churchill had said that Hitler's plan was undoubtedly Poland in 39, France in 40, Russia in 41, England in 42, and maybe America in 1943. The 
Unknown War will be back after this. It's to June 22nd, 1941. In the opening phases of Operation Barbarossa, tens of thousands of Soviet troops died or were made prisoner. George Marshall told President Roosevelt that Russia would fall in less than three months. British Field Marshal Wavell said only six weeks. Hitler declared that the Soviet Union was already crushed. Hitler's boast was premature. Gradually, the terrible toll of Soviet troops and material slackened. commanders became impressed by Soviet resistance. General Gunter Blumentritt said, even when in circle, the Russians stand their ground and fight. garrison of the Brest Fortress was still holding out after a month of siege. This is the fortress, the message came. And we are still fighting. I'm standing at the battle-scarred walls of the fortress of Brest, on the western border of the USSR. At dawn on June 22, 1941, the Nazis began their savage drive eastward across the Russian frontier. Brest was the first target to be hit. It was a surprise attack, not unlike the one launched by the Japanese on Pearl Harbor. The Germans attacked the fortress with bombs and artillery. They blasted it with flamethrowers. The assaults were unrelenting, but the garrison would not surrender. For more than four weeks, 4,000 Russian soldiers defended the fortress against 17,500 Nazi troops. As the bulk of the German forces continued their push eastward, the fortress was now an island, surrounded by a sea of Germans. Most of the Brest garrison perished in this uneven battle. Only a handful managed to fight their way through more than 400 miles of Nazi-occupied territory, 
to rejoin the Red Army troops at the front lines. The Russian people call the heroes of Brest the immortal garrison. Hitler himself announced the fall of the citadel. He took his ally Mussolini on a sightseeing tour of the German army's achievements on the Eastern Front. The highlight was Brest. Was defiance still on its walls, incised with bayonets. I am dying, but I will not surrender. Farewell, my country. At the time, the West knew almost nothing of the scale of the sacrifice the Soviet Union was being forced to make, or the source of the Russian strength. July 3rd, 1941, Joseph Stalin addressed the nation by radio. The German army was driving for Leningrad, Moscow, and Kiev. Stalin's message spoke of life or death for the Soviet Union. Comrades, citizens, Brothers and sisters, I am speaking to you, my friends. The vicious military attack by Nazi Germany against our country that began on June 22nd continues. Despite the heroic resistance of the Red Army, a serious danger hangs over our country. <laughs> Stalin called on the nation to halt the aggressor, to keep the Germans from penetrating far into Russia, and to launch a broad partisan war. The entire nation was to become one vast military camp. Stalin became head of the State Defense Committee. Soon he would be commander-in-chief. and the Russians gave the war their own name. It became the Great Patriotic War. All our efforts to support our heroic Red Army, our glorious Red Navy, and all the efforts of the nation to smash the enemy, onward to victory. produced his first great song, The Sacred War.
aided by civilian volunteers who built tank traps in defensive positions, and by partisans who fought behind the lines, the Red Army gradually slowed the German advance. What they were forced to give up, they destroyed. The Unknown War will return in a moment. It's to June 22, 1941. The Red Air Force made it difficult for the Luftwaffe to gain absolute control in the air. On the ground, the Soviet infantry contested every yard. Russian artillery proved very formidable. August, Marshal Zhukov even won a victory, driving the Nazis back to Yelda. It was the first German retreat of the Second World War. By now the Wehrmacht had lost half the tanks with which it had entered Russia. 1,300 aircraft and over half a million men. Russian counterattacks were something the Wehrmacht had not encountered before. Also, the Germans had not foreseen the problems of supplying their spearheads after the speed of their initial advance had carried them far across the plains of Russia. scenes began to be reversed. A captured German command post. The first German prisoners were numbed. Their Führer had promised them a quick and easy victory. But this was the first taste of defeat.
steadily, the fighting grew more intense. Gradually, the Red Army reorganized its communication with the Stavka, the Soviet high command, bringing heavier and heavier force to bear. crescendo of Katusha. The multi-barreled rocket launcher was heard for the first time. A Soviet secret weapon. In the air, the struggle was as intense. The Soviet Air Force had lost heavily during the first hours of Barbarossa. Now, it gradually deployed its latest bombers and fighters. The Soviet army was still on the defensive, but whenever possible, it took offensive action. No one in Russia sought to minimize the danger. The great cities of Leningrad and Kiev were in peril, and day by day, the menace pressed closer to Moscow itself. Hitler confidently announced, soldiers, Moscow is ahead of you. You have marched through the streets of the finest cities of Europe. Only Moscow remains. Make her bow. Show her the strength of your weapon. Walk through her square. Moscow will be the end of the war. They cheered before they died. of extreme crisis, party members prided themselves on being the first to fight and the first to die. Blood-stained party cards honored the claim. of victory, these soldiers of 1941. In the 1,418 days of war, millions would fight and millions would die. They were to be the unknown soldiers of the unknown war. Our next story, the battle for Moscow. In the fall of 1941, the unbeaten Nazi legions came within sight of the spires of the Kremlin. In an epic battle, the Red Army pushed them back and destroyed the myth of the German invincibility. It was a turning point in the unknown war. <laughs> 